start. <laughs> We're recording now. Okay, excellent. So welcome to the eighth meeting of the ISO Foundation Board of Trustees. It's already eight meetings, time flies, and we have accomplished a lot, and Sarah will be presenting some of that shortly. So first of all, let me welcome the new trustees. Um, we had you know, a few new trustees this year, and this is their official, um, well, their first official you know, ISO Foundation uh, board meeting. So welcome all of you. Um, we didn't get any apologies today. Um, do we have any conflict of interest given the agenda today? Anyone wants to recuse himself or herself from any discussion? Okay, seeing none, let's um, start with the agenda. Um, so first, we're going to document the um, resolutions that we have approved by e-vote um, since last time. And as I always say, this is not to approve the actual resolutions. They were already approved. It's just to document them. And as you see, it's just to approve the minutes of the previous foundation board meeting we had. Um, so that was it. I'm moving um, directly to point number three on the agenda. Um, Sarah will give us some updates. So with that, I would like to give the, the floor to Sarah. And hello, everyone. Before we start the slides, I would like to say, first of all, I'm thrilled to be working with five new people. I have been blessed with an amazing group of folks over the past 12 months in which I've been in this job. And I want to say I'm excited about continuing to work with all of them who will be continuing to work with us. Um, but it is exciting to meet all of the new people. I know we met during orientation, but um, this time you're going to hear a lot more about what we've been doing and um, you'll hear not just from me, but from a wonderful teammate of mine, Shana Robinson, who I will introduce a little bit more um, into the presentation when we get to her part. So um, the first word I wanna share with you is celebration. There is a celebration to be had for the progress of the foundation. We are one year old officially now in the sense that I started a year ago. I met everyone for the first time my third week on the job at the AGM last year in Montreal. And that was a really great way <laughs> to start a new job. Um, and we have so much to celebrate since that day that I'm just so thrilled to be able to share all the things that we've accomplished. Um, I do want to say there are a couple of words that come to mind when I think of the foundation. There's a little alliteration here for the English side of things. Um, passionate, purposeful, productive, dedicated to making an impact, devoted, and diverse. We are global. We are guided by very firm and important principles, and we are growing. We've come a long way over the past 12 months. So today, while we are all together, we will share with you the things that we have accomplished. Um, because we have some new board members, um, I ask the patients of the older board members that there may be some things that I go over a bit just to be sure that the context is there for them since they are brand new. Um, I will not belabor points, but certainly I'm open to questions or further up, uh, follow up discussions if there is more that you feel like you need to know. So um, with that, I think Kevin, we can go ahead and go to the first slide. Okay, this one's kind of like, everybody has to have one of these. <laughs> this is the title slide. So the Internet Society Foundation, today we are going to talk about an overview of the foundation. We're gonna talk about technology, and I don't mean, oh, we're gonna get into these little data points and everybody's gonna be playing in a system. The reason I put technology at the top of the agenda is that we could not be successful without the right system. When I joined the foundation a year ago, I was asked to take a look at what tools were available at the Internet Society to see if any of them would be transferable and successful for the Internet Society Foundation. And after quite a bit of studying and talking, I made the decision, in fact, that it would not be adequate and that we needed a new system. Why did we need a new system? Because we are dedicated to really thorough reporting. We want to know impact. We want to know our applicants. We want to know our grantees. We want to know their financial situation. We want to know their financial management skills. We need to know if they match our mission. We need to know if they're a 501c3 or equivalent. And we need to know if their chapters, what their history has been with the Internet Society. 
For that, we need, hold on, Kevin, if we could stay on the agenda for just a bit more. For that, thank you very much. For that, we need great technology. So that's why it's at the top of the list. And I'm not going to belabor it, but I will talk a little bit about the successes that we've had in choosing an amazing system after a very exhaustive request for proposal process that we performed last fall. We're then going to talk about our ongoing programs. Most of these are during the, inter are during the orientation. I know that we talked about, so none of the names are probably surprises to you, but I will give you an update on where we are and what we've accomplished in these particular program areas. And again, like I said, there's a lot to celebrate. We're also going to talk about a program area. It's not new in the sense that it was never talked about before. It was talked about from the beginning, from the board, from the ISOC staff, and from the uh, consultants that were brought in to help shape the foundation, Bridgespan as a very important program area for us to pursue. But as of our last board meeting, we were still wrestling with what the program would look like. So now I'm gonna call it a new program and it's being run by a new program officer, Shana Robinson, who you'll meet later a little bit more. Um, so we'll talk about our people, the team that we've built in order to make this successful. While technology is really key, you can't just rely on that, you have to have a heck of a team and I am so fortunate to share with you that I have the most amazing colleagues. I get emotional when I think about how fortunate I am in terms of the types of people who have joined the foundation. We do also work with uh, Internet Society staff, again, about whom we feel terrific, uh, but our staff itself is separate from the foundation and this, as Sandy had pointed out yesterday, we do get charged back for the time that ISOC staff spends on the foundation, but uh, we do have our own separate budget of salaries, et cetera. Then I just want to touch again on our process of how we select who is going to get funding, and that's part of our people because those people are part of our team as well. I want to talk about training. Training is something I personally feel committed to, that we have to have it. The reason I feel it's important is not just for the reasons that we've discussed during the ISOC board meeting and the uh, different training modules that are being developed and the upgrades that they're doing that Renalia's department is working on, but it's also a way of showing your grantees and your applicants of all types, chapters, others, that you care about them. You don't just say, make an application, good luck. Instead, you say, if you go to our website, we're going to help you be able to do this really well. And we're going to help you understand what makes a good program, what makes a good application, what makes good financial management. And I want to talk to you about where we're going with that. And then finally, communications. We heard from James yesterday. We know the importance of communications. You have to have it. You can do everything in the world if you don't talk about it and get into dialogues with your different audiences. You know. What's the point, right? You've got to have good communications. So with that, we'll go ahead and move into the technology slide. Uh, Kevin, sorry, <laughs> next slide, please. Oh, sorry, first we're gonna do overview. <laughs> okay, so this, I apologize. This is the slide, next slide, that you have seen before. This is the Venn diagram that shows that our programs are intended to overlap. I'll give you an example. We talk as a team all the time and we are always looking for ways in which what Shana is doing can help another one of her teams. What her grantees are learning can apply to some other grantees of another program. We make sure that we integrate and then our plan is to make sure our grantees integrate. Their grant right now they are integrating and meeting within their own program areas and we'll get into that a bit but we really feel it's important that they all stay together and that we're about impacting humanity and we're doing it through an open, globally connected, secure and trustworthy internet for all. So we are furthering the mission of the Internet Society and we are doing it through philanthropy, series of different programs. In addition to those programs that you see in that very colorful diagram, you see on the left-hand side, or at least my left-hand side of the slide, um, that we also, of course, of course, support global, regional, and national IGFs. 
those were formally funded by the Internet Society, and as of 2020, they became the responsibility of the foundation. We are working with pretty much everyone who was working with ISOC. Um, the difference is we've established some criteria for the IGFs that were not in place before. So a little bit more stringent in terms of how the funding is provided and what's expected in return. And then I don't have to spend any more time on IETF because we've talked a lot about that. As Sandy explained, we've been giving, that's part of us, we, um, 5 million in 2019, 5 million in 2020. And at this very moment, we're having discussions with them to decide what looks, you know, what will be important to them from a funding standpoint moving forward. And um, as Gonzalo mentioned earlier, we should be hearing from Jason um, and I don't know, maybe others from IETF um, starting in September. So at that point, we'll know what our budget should be for 2021 going forward to support the LLC of the IETF. Next slide, please. Now technology. Okay. So the technology, as I mentioned, is important because it holds everything together. It has an amazing ability to track and to store and to remember and to ask the right questions. And it has all of these things that I had never heard of before because I'm not a technology expert, but little hints along the way of things you can click on if you need more information about how to fill out a certain piece of the um, application or how to fill out a report. It's a very thorough system. And I just want to share with you some information Right now, next slide, please. So all of our programs are being done in flux and all the programs that you saw on that Venn diagram, of course, are not active, but those that are active are in there. And then we also are, we migrated a whole lot of data over from um, Member Nova. We migrated everything from 2016 and beyond. And why did we do that? We wanted to be sure we had comparisons to the type of work the chapters had done in the past versus what they're doing now. There also was in Member Nova and is now in Flux, all the information about chapter officers. When that gets updated in Member Nova, that automatically gets updated in Flux. So it's very important that the two systems continue to speak with one another. And so we're doing that. So Flux is the name of the system. That's just a screenshot from their website. Next slide, please. So here are some numbers to share. Um, I'm not gonna go through all this, but as you can see, we're up to 2,400 users of the system. Now, what is a user? A user can be an applicant. It can be somebody who's expressing a statement of interest. It can be me, it can be Shana. It can be one of our many reviewers. It can be one of many chapter officers. So it's all over the map and the numbers are growing in terms of who's in the system. We have conducted enormous amounts of training. And if you look at that quote at the bottom of this slide, I was thrilled when Victor wrote this email. Victor, of course, is in our Africa region, and he says the Flux system truly made the grant application hassle-free in my Internet Society region. Zero system-related complaints for the first time. We did something really right here, and it is thrilling to know that it's easy. And you know what's amazing? It's easy for all of our audiences. When I talk to you about our program known as Emergency Response COVID-19, you'll be pleased to know that all of the new reviewers that went in there from the independent review panel found the system easy to use as well. So I think enough said about technology. I just wanted to be sure you were clear on where it came from, what it does, and the purpose. Because of course it was a big investment, but boy, it certainly has a great ROI. Next slide, please. As I mentioned early on, in addition to technology, I wanted to talk to you about an update on our ongoing program areas. So let's go ahead and go to the next slide. The first one is Beyond the Net Small. This, for those who don't know, is a program that was run by the Internet Society for quite some time. At one point, it was called Community Grants. This started like uh, more than 10 years ago, where um, chapters were applying for funding from the Internet Society to do different things like 
events, um, maybe funding an IGF national, just did some amazing things. As I don't have to tell the people on this team how incredible the chapters are in their commitment to wanting to make a difference in their community, which makes them very important to us since that's what we're all about. This year for the Call of Small, we got 84 applications, so quite a few more than we did in uh, 2019. We've given out 30 awards for $102,000, but we don't give all of the grants at once. What we did was looked at those that were needed, they needed the funding quickly, and we awarded those as quickly as we could. As you can still see, we still have a number of applications that we need to review. We'll do that throughout the rest of August, make the other awards, and then we'll make another call in September. You'll see that we hit all regions of the country. Uh, we also had one SIG apply, so we just put them out there in the global land, as you can see, SIG one. Um, but you can see we had a number of applications from Africa. And in some cases, when you see these numbers, I want to make sure it's clear that every chapter is allowed to apply for two beyond the net small grants in a year. So there, are, there is some overlap that sometimes there's two from Zimbabwe or two from Senegal, right? So the 40 doesn't mean 40 separate chapters. It could be two in some cases from one of them. Next slide, please. The Beyond the Net Large, this one for those who don't know, goes up to $30,000. Again, this was a program that was part of the Internet Society before the foundation was established. At one time, it was called medium and large. It went from 15,000 to 30,000. We decided, let's just go for 30, because <laughs> there's a lot you can do with 30. And we decided just to call it beyond the net large. Uh, as you can see, we received 36 applications, um, not quite as many as last year, but so similar. I just wanted to give you a quick idea of the types of things that the large grants are applying for. Community networks, of course, is always a big one. Um, and as you can see, we also received seven that specifically were addressing COVID-19. Now, the reason we've only made one award at this time is that unlike Beyond the Net Small, the Beyond the Net Large, because of the size of the grants, excuse me, has a selection committee that is available to review the grants for us. So as a result, the process is longer. So we are waiting now. We've just received input from the selection committee on which grants they feel we should award. And so we'll be doing that soon. And then as you can see, we'll make another call for uh, grants for the um, October time period. So um, Kevin, I would like right now just to go to looking at people and not slides just for a minute or two. Thank you very much. So the next program I'm gonna share with you is called Emergency Response COVID-19. Just so you know, this was not something that was in our portfolio. When I took this job a year ago, there was nothing in the portfolio of things to consider that said anything about a pandemic. So, okay, that's, that's right, okay. But then we get to this place where there is a pandemic. And myself and my team, as well as I know every one of you on this call, are extremely passionate and need to do something when there is a problem in the world like a pandemic, especially one that is so dependent on using the internet. I sat in my chair one afternoon at home, of course, because at that point we were not going into the office anymore for safety reasons and said, I have to get the team together. We have to do something about this pandemic. I know people who are dying. I know people who can't get education. I know people who can't get healthcare. I know people who need to be trained. Things have turned around and the internet can help address these problems. What can we do? So we decided that we would take funding from a different pool that we knew we would not spend as we talked about yesterday during the finance discussion that we would not spend in 2020. And we approached the board and asked them for a resolution to please take $1.5 million out of what was then called the disaster fund 
and move it and make it a COVID-19 fund. And I wanna thank the board for their amazingly prompt response. John put together a resolution in like, I don't know, an hour. <laughs> he was great. All of a sudden it was done. And we got e-votes from every single person within just days. So as soon as that happened, oh, okay, now we gotta figure out what this program looks like. So we had a lot of discussions about what we wanted to do, but a funny story I wanna share with you is the woman that is on this call with me today, Shana Robinson, had just, just accepted a job to be the research and innovation program officer. And on her very first day, I said, we need to have a phone call first thing. I will show you on this call a document called COVID-19. And I said to her at the end of that call, I need you to take this program on and help me make sure that we can help people during COVID. And sure enough, she took it on and she became the COVID person and she's now managing four amazing grants. So we can go back to the slide now. And Kevin, I'd like to share with you what our statistics look like for the COVID-19 grants. So the next one, yeah. Okay, so as I mentioned, we were responding to an urgent need. We needed the board to approve the resolution, they did. We received 580 expressions of interest. We received 420 applications. And remember, we're doing all of this on an accelerated schedule because it's important to us to get the money out. 131 of the applications went to our independent review panel. They were selected based on their expertise. They came back and made a recommendation for funding 30. 30 of them, however, totaled $11.5 million, which we did not have. So we had to go through a process whereby we looked at all the scoring and all the comments to choose which were the ones that we would fund. And I'm very proud to say we came up with a very, very comprehensive global response to COVID-19. I'm gonna ask Kevin to go to the next slide, which I am not going to read, <laughs> but it does show you, and I, you have this in your board effect file, so you can certainly have a look at these. There's also a lot of information on our website about the COVID-19 program. And there also are a lot of posts in our social media. So you can see here that we, we did it. <laughs> I mean, I, I, sometimes I, I say to the staff, okay, I know, I know, that was my crazy time, right? But thank you, we made it happen and we have a lot again to celebrate and that's the theme of this presentation. We went global, we went with an organization based in Latin America and Argentina, Olga. We have a, we're an organization working in Asia and in Africa. And as you can see, we've done all of that for our budget of $1.5 million. So I'm really excited about the emergency response program, about the Beyond the Net large, and about the Beyond the Net small. And now I'd like to talk to you about one more program, but I do, before I want to do that, just want to pause because I've done a lot of talking and see if I can take any questions so far. Um, yeah, we, we were commenting that it was great actually to have um, all these proposals and the and the you know expert of I mean the panel of experts actually review them and uh, and uh, I mean the, the whole thing is working so well so at least I'm I'm very happy with how things are progressing and and the pace at which things are progressing um, but maybe someone else has questions or wants to make a comment especially the the new trustees if you have any questions this would be a, a great time to ask Sarah. Okay, I see no questions. Okay, good, so maybe we can continue. Right, we'll go back to the slides. Thank you, Kevin. So the next slide is on a program called SKILLS. SKILLS is an acronym that we came up with that stands for Strengthening Communities, Improving Lives and Livelihoods. This program was originally called Capacity Building when Bridgespan and the board and the other members of ISOC who were helping to shape the foundation picked an area they thought was important. They called it capacity building. 
when I read all the research and I read everything that they had done to come up with the name or come up with the type of program, I realized it needed to be a little bit more specific. And I have had been working very closely with the Strategic Advisory Committee, which is a subcommittee of this board. And to a person we agreed, we didn't want to call it capacity building. It just was too broad a term. In some places, it just didn't really make that much sense. So what we wanted to do instead was build skills. We wanted to take people who were based in areas that had access to the internet, but in fact did not necessarily realize the benefit. Or perhaps there was no content that was relevant. Or perhaps it wasn't accessible to people with disabilities. There are all kinds of reasons why, even if you're connected, you may not be benefiting from the internet. So we wanted to do something that was different, that really focused on those audiences. And we decided to focus our areas of economic growth, health outcomes, and education to be the ones that we would use the internet and the benefits of the internet to change lives. So next slide will give you some updates on how we've done on the skills program. One of the things that we did with skills that we did not do with emergency response is we asked for statements of interest. That means it's a pre-application. In the case of COVID-19, we did not do it because we were trying to move faster. In the case of skills, we are not moving as fast. So we are asking people for um, statements of interest so that we can get a better idea of the quality of the applicant before we have them go to the trouble of going through the full application process, which of course is a tremendous amount of work, even though we have a great system in which you can do it. Um, we decided to pilot test the um, skills program and we picked one country in three different regions, Bangladesh, obviously in APAC, Colombia, obviously in LAC, and Senegal, obviously in, and I think there's one new board member who might like that idea. Um, and so one thing I wanna point out here is if you were to take the time to go back to the board meeting in March, I made a very firm case for why these countries made sense. I don't feel like it's important, a good use of our time to go back through that this time, but certainly I did a lot of research and Oh, the last, <laughs> it's it kind of just skill by itself uh, <laughs> was just a little like too brief. So we decided we wanted to add the S um, and we also did because it is about skill building. So it's building skills. So that's the other reason why. Yeah. And livelihoods too. Yeah, that's right. Thank you, Mike. <laughs> um, so there are a couple reasons why that S is there. Uh, so anyway, we had Bangladesh, Colombia, and Senegal. You can see on the right-hand side the types of um, programs they're interested in funding. And at the bottom, you can see what our timeline is on skills. So we started in June. We got our statements of interest by the 3rd of July, did the pre-screen, and then sent back saying to people, okay, it's definitely time for... Um, for you to submit a full application. And now we're waiting in the next couple of weeks, we'll be getting our full proposals. Those full proposals will go to the independent review panel, again, connecting with the skill sets so that we're sure we have the right people who are telling us which grants we should fund and decisions will be shared in September. So I've just shared with you all of the different program areas that we have. And there is one other area that we're funding that I mentioned up front. Next slide, please. And that is the internet governance forums. We have both national and regional IGFs as well as schools of internet governance. And just as an update, we've um, provided funding for 12 applications so far this year, uh, just over 77,000 US in funding. And then we will also be funding the IGF Global. That is something that the Internet Society has done traditionally. I've been in touch with the UN and we've talked about the amount and we've talked about the schedule. And that piece will be, um, I understand now the meeting was finally scheduled. Uh, there'll be the pre-week, the last week of October, and then the, or the uh, virtual conference itself will be in um, the first week of November. 
So we'll be funding that as well. So um, that's a lot. <laughs> Those are the programs on which we've been working and that we will continue to work and manage um, and do a lot of continuing contact. Uh, we've spent a lot of time connecting with chapters to help them improve their ability to apply for funding and manage the grants. Um, Shana is spending a lot of time with her ER COVID-19 group to make sure again that they're um, learning from each other and that they're clear on what they need to do. Brittany, who's our program officer for skills, doing the same um, as she moves through working with um, those who have um, expressed the statement of interest and been asked to apply. And in fact, um, she was told that the phone call she's making to check in on them is unheard of in the foundation world, that the whole idea of a foundation caring about an applicant before they're even a grantee is um, never heard of. <laughs> but we're doing it anyway, because that's part of the positioning of our organization. So now it's time to talk. Next slide, please, about a new program area. Again, if there are any questions, I can take them now before we get into this. This will be Shana's discussion primarily. I'm just going to do an intro. Uh, only briefly, plus one, yeah, the, the, the work you guys have been doing pre-application. I think that's a really valuable way of building up a community here and, and you know, you ex you know, make, making these programs really have access in the areas where they need it. Yeah, well, they were quite surprised, <laughs> which I thought was um, was a good sign to have that. Yeah, um, we just feel like it's important to do as much nurturing and caring as we can. Yes, Mike. I just want to say, just for the record, I worked with uh, uh, Mito in Myanmar before they were a grantee for Internews. So there's at least one other <laughs> NGO. <laughs> that had that fielded people before they were grant to okay. advise before their grant grantees. It's okay. I think it's a good thing to do, obviously, because I did it. But I just want to be on the well. So so you see, it's great minds. Yeah, of course that's what it is. But the great mind wasn't me. It was Kathleen Reen at Internews who said, "Mike, go help Myanmar," and then I did. Yes. All right. Good. Thank you. Um, okay, so if, oh yeah, what do you have? Oh, yeah. I mean, I just wanted to say uh, and wonderful work I've uh, been monitoring it, and, and I'm glad that uh, the, the committee itself worked uh, seamlessly. Maybe it's uh, a blessing in disguise having the COVID disaster made everyone online sit long for longer hours, so that may have been one you know part of the cup that was full. Another thing is that I'm expecting more publicity and more branding because I and many others are working very hard to promote the foundation, so keep it up. We will. And in fact, Waleed, thank you for raising that. I will talk a little about our communications effort. We are really starting to ramp that up. And the great news is our followers and our page views and our um, open rates on certain things we're sending, all of that is going in the right direction. So. Okay, so Kevin, we can go back to the slides. I think it's kind of fun to stop and look at each other a little more once in a while. So, so the new program area started as an idea that needed formulation, as I mentioned. So we hosted a workshop in January with experts from many different places. Next slide, please. You see here, this is a photograph of the people that we assembled, and we had an amazing, amazing evening and day workshop where we were able to really talk about where some of the gaps were, what sorts of things really needed to be addressed when it came to research, and we just had a very robust conversation and came out with some great things that Shana will talk with you about because she's now taken the results and turned it into a real solid program. So post-workshop, I was blessed that I was able to get to NDSS. It was not canceled before COVID. And I was able to do, well, for those who know me, I tend to be somewhat outgoing. Um, and I <laughs> reached out to a lot of people, telling them who I was and what I was trying to do and had a lot of coffees. I'm a decaf drinker, thank goodness. Um, and I uh, just learned a lot from them about what we had been thinking about. They also gave me phone numbers and email addresses for a lot of people 
thought could help further. So I spent a lot of time engaged in conversations to also run some of the ideas by these people. Then I came to the board in March and we talked a lot. And at that time, again, I just wanna uh, put a thank you to the Strategic Advisory Committee for helping. You'll see the members there in the picture, Olga and Pepper, Hans, Peter, who, as we know, is not on the board anymore. But, um, and then we also, somewhere tucked over there is John and, oh, Richard, you weren't able to make it. Richard also was on the advisory committee, but was not, he's not in the picture. <laughs> um, and then after that, it was time to refine it. So this program officer that was working busily on COVID-19 was asked to also start thinking about research. And it's time now for me to introduce an amazing woman, Shana Robinson, who's gonna tell you about concepts and strategies that she's come up with for where we wanna go with research for the Internet Society Foundation. So might I now introduce Shana Robinson. Thank you so much, Sarah. And uh, it's really nice to virtually meet all of you. Um, although Andrew and, and Sandy, I know you guys, uh, but I, I know that you've had a, a day and a half, I guess, almost two days of, of meeting. And so we'll try to keep this short uh, and quick, but I appreciate your time uh, and thanks for, for listening. And thank you for the support um, for the work that we're doing at the foundation. Uh, Kevin, can we go to the next slide? Thanks. So from everything that Sarah discussed and all the uh, inputs from all the various stakeholders that were uh, concerned about the research program, we had a few outputs that really uh, gave us some direction in terms of the thematic areas that we would address through the research program. Uh, the first was around identifying critical needs um, for those who wanted to engage the internet, um, who may, as Sarah said earlier, in regards to the skills program, who may have access but um, are not fully engaging or fully taking advantage of all the opportunity available to them via the internet. Uh, the second uh, sort of output or thematic area that we, that we gathered from those talks and discussions was around security, internet security um, and connectivity. And then the third um, was, which is one that I really found interesting uh, and thoughtful was around the impact of the internet uh, on the climate and the environment. And so those were sort of the three um, areas that emerged from all of these discussions that would help lead us uh, and guide us as we built out the program. Next slide. So to sum it up, uh, essentially the focus of the research program is really to strengthen and support um, research collaborations that really help us to understand the usefulness uh, whether it's real or potential, the usefulness of the internet um, for everyone. Next slide. So we took that focus um, that came out of the, those workshops and we sort of created or crafted a theory of change which pretty much recommits that focus, um, but is more explicit around creating novel approaches uh, that are you know, applied research projects and that in some aspect um, are collaborative. So we really wanted to focus on that. And we thought that if we could do that through this program, then we would be able to achieve sort of uh, the outcomes that we wanted to see. So we're in the process. We're very close to launching the program. Uh, we're looking at a date of September 1st to, to open the window, um, but stay tuned uh, and, and stay posted for that one. Next. Thanks. Um, so there are three main objectives uh, that, that we've decided for the program. And again, the first one really is around figuring out and finding out new uh, epistemologies, uh, new ways of thinking about uh, the internet and understanding the challenges of the internet so that we can come up with, you know, some really uh, novel solutions. Uh, the second is around identifying and supporting diverse researchers who work across a variety of disciplines because we think that collaboration really is a key to, to coming up with those useful solutions. And then thirdly, we wanted to make sure that the, the research that we support um, is practical, that it answers questions that are relevant to today. So they're not just theoretical in nature, but they really uh, drive 
you know, decision making in government and industry. So uh, there are four areas of focus. We're gonna, uh, we're gonna actually in this first call that we're launching in September, we're gonna focus on two, uh, greening the internet. So that's around climate uh, and the environment, which I think again is, is a really important and, and interesting topic. And then the second one is around the internet economy. Uh, and later in 2021, once we get sort of the program off the ground and up and running, we'll introduce uh, the, the following two uh, areas of focus. Next. Um, so one of the things uh, that we really, I think for me personally that I learned um, through the emergency response program and launching that was that it was very competitive. Um, as Sarah stated before, we had over 420 uh, applications for that program. And you know, while there were many, 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 many projects that we wanted to fund, um, obviously we couldn't fund them all. And so what we want to do here with this uh, program is to try to make it a little less competitive and more collaborative. And I think the way that we're gonna do that is through a four stage application process. So the first stage is really to invite folks to submit ideas for research projects, um, anything that they can you know, think of that are related to those first two areas of focus. Um, and with no geographical you know, boundary or limit, it really is just whatever they think uh, would be interesting. From there, we would choose uh, ideas that we thought were uh, really creative, but also uh, feasible. And we would workshop them to get to a full proposal. So this part is really around working with the researchers, also researchers who have submitted uh, similar topics or similar questions that they want to look at. We can put them in a, in a virtual room together um, to sort of talk through and think through what a research project could look like um, and how each of them could be, you know, integrated, whatever their focus is or their particular lens or angle, how we could support them to work together to, to really make a, a multidisciplinary uh, research project. Um, so once that's done, once we get to a full proposal, it will go to the IRP again, um, the same way that we've done for the COVID grants who would then review um, and you know, provide any insights or questions or uh, guidance in that respect. And then finally, we would make uh, decisions for grant awards. So that's it in a nutshell, I think. Uh, yeah, I think that's the last slide I have uh, for this program. But does anyone have any questions or thoughts on that? Thank you. Thanks a lot. I, I have questions on the on the queue. So Richard is first. Richard, please. Hey, thanks. So thanks for the overview of this, Shannon. This looks like a really interesting program. We were joking in the chat that the greening in the greening the internet uh, program should just be entirely about eliminating proof of work blockchains. Like if we could get like all that carbon emission out of them, eliminate a significant chunk of the climate impact of the internet. Um, I just wanted to observe, uh, I think this, this idea of uh, fostering collaboration in that stage two of the research process is a really interesting one. Um, I'm reminded of some stuff, stuff uh, some patterns that DARPA does in the US. They tend to have on um, what they call proposers days where they bring people together and they talk about the general problem they're trying to solve with the research program. And it's it's kind of a one big bucket, it might be a little less structured than you were thinking, but it's certainly their, their idea there too encourage people to form teams and team up for more compelling full proposals. So there may be some art there that you could uh, lean on. Yeah, definitely. It's funny that you say that because uh, DARPA and their sort of broad agency uh, announcements is, was one of the inspirations for, for this methodology. And so absolutely, yeah, absolutely. We're, we're looking at that and seeing how that process rolls out. And I think they do some great stuff. So and I, I do have some connections over there if that would be helpful. Also, oh, awesome. know if, if you'd like to hear it from Horse Smell. Definitely, thanks. Okay, um, any, any more questions? No, I'm not sure if yeah. Walid, you are the real Walid. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe you want to say something. I am a poor guy, I mean, I couldn't have my uh, background work because of the low CPU power. Okay. Um, yeah, anyway, I, I, as a researcher, I'm really fascinated by this um, project. And I really admire the work of methodologically identifying these, uh, let's say, pots. Uh, I do recognize there will be a challenge later on because you can obviously interpret various things as uh, related to 
And let's say, for example, the issue of climate change. One can look into it from, from the perspective of the internet having to be run on computers. And so electricity and energy would come up as the, 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 part of the issue here. It's not directly impacted. So uh, having said that, I also uh, uh, understand that this would be an open call. So is it limited to countries or is it global? Yes, it's an open call. So it's, it's global to any researchers. And to your point, um, you know, in your example about the, the climate, I think that's sort of what we're looking for. We're looking for uh, projects that are going to look at it from a lot of different angles. And if we can get all of those people in the room together, that maybe we would have some interesting, you know, dialogue and synergies come out of that. So I think we're keeping it broad on purpose because we want to just see what comes out of it. But I think during the workshop phase is where we're really sort of massage it and get it to, to a place where we're answering questions that, that we want to see answered, not only the researchers. Thanks. Okay, and, and I've been just told that Hans Peter's threat wasn't an empty threat. He's actually you know, checking us. He's actually watching us live as an observer. So hello, Hans Peter. <laughs> That's good to know. Hans Peter was the, the former chair of the advisory committee. We are um, reconstituting today. So, so that's great to have him. Yes, I'm this. very glad he's here. Nice to exactly. have him. Exactly. Okay, any, any more questions here? Um, yeah, I think, I think it's great actually the amount of applications you guys are getting and, and also, you know, the collaborative approach as, as Richard already mentioned, just to, to make sure that we are making, I mean, basically people feel comfortable and, and try to, you know, direct them in the best possible way. So I, I think this is, this is really good. And we are making very good progress. So, so again, you know, I'm, I'm very happy about all this. Um, any comments or, okay, so then we can continue, I guess. There's a queue or? Oh, yeah, there's a queue, there's a queue, Gonzo. There's a queue, of course, yeah. Um, you have a queue. Maimuna. Thank you, thank you, Gonzo. I will be very short. I just want, first of all, to thank no, you. No, take, take your time. My Muna. <laughs> <laughs> so thanks, Sarah and China, for this presentation. I have um, um, just to raise the, the question of um, the challenging of the research, because when you talk about um, climate change, there's not only internet or um, technology, there is so lot of things to, to address. Uh, so it would be challenging. And my question is, do you have any, you know, um, uh, support university or uh, a research group you, who can help you to 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 choose um, the right uh, right project? And I have a second question about the research because um, before uh, this new program, uh, most of the research was um, apply for a grant, uh, a large grant to do the research. Does it mean that if you have a project, a research project, you are you will not be able to uh, to apply for the lab grant? Um, so I'll answer your second question first. Um, no. So you, if you apply for a research grant and you're awarded a grant, you're also able to apply for any of our other programs. Uh, we're not we're not making that um, sort of an either or. Um, and the grants, I should say, which we didn't, what I didn't discuss, um, could be long-term grants up to two years and 250,000 US dollars uh, would be the maximum in the ceiling for those grants. Um, so again, you could potentially apply for that and be eligible to apply for other programs. And then to your first question around, uh, again, climate, I think, you know, I've been working really hard to identify folks in the space who work, you know, around technology and climate change, it's pretty tough to find them. Uh, so if anyone has, um, you know, recommendations or people that they know that they want to put me in touch with, I'm happy to take those, uh, those references. Um, but I think one of the reasons why we chose to do that first is because it is still, uh, you know, a new space and, and a space that, you know, not a lot of research has happened already. And so we thought it would be a good place to start. Um, but again, if you have recommendations or people, institutions that you know are working in, those, in that space, please let me know. Was there another question? 
I think from Olga. Yes, I was trying to unmute myself. Olga, please. Thank you, thank you. And um, my, I want to commend Sarah on all her team because of the great work. I won't repeat that she knows how much I appreciate all what she does. And, and the beautiful picture of the workshop, we were good to, to have the chance to do it face to face. We were almost near closing all the i remember being in in the in the in the airport and they were starting to announce the covid thing um so the question is about this research is it already open or, or which is the timing and if there will be uh, a need to go through some of the SIGs or chapters or it's just people can apply directly to the to the call Yes, so we're looking at a open date of September 1st. Uh, so we're still chatting with legal. There are a few questions that we have to get uh, answered and kind of work through a bit before we can make it public. But the, the goal is to get it open by September 1st um, and it will be open to anyone. Everyone is eligible. So if there are members of chapters that, you know, there's no, um, there's no sort of limit geographically or anything like that. Okay, Olga, are you okay or you want to follow up? Okay, okay, excellent. Um, thank you, Olga. Uh, Pepper, please. Yeah, really quickly. So first, um, thank you, uh, uh, you know, Shannon, Sarah. This It's amazing, like, in six months what you've uh, achieved, actually less than six months. Um, it's pretty amazing and it's a great agenda. Um, because I remember, yeah, the discussions as they were bubbling up uh, at the workshop. Um, a couple of things. One, um, the 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 intersection these are you know four areas but in fact as we've already been discussing they're actually quite interrelated so internet economy climate change um and a closing digital divide i mean there's a lot of uh sort of interaction and non-mutual exclusivity but that's okay that's great um because one of the things that we do know is one of the barriers to closing the digital divide is access to electricity uh, recent data looking at that, uh, which I'm happy, Shana, to, to send you. Um, uh, but that raises some of the, the climate change issues. Mm -hmm. um, and so um, I, I love the way these things can actually be working off of one another. And the, the, the DARPA-like approach, which we've already discussed, I think is great because what we want is to promote um, the sort of collaboration instead of, you know, individual researchers competing um, for grants, but rather um, you know, it should be one plus one equals about 14 by bringing people together. And it's a, and it's a, it's a leveraging effect that we have. So it's not just about giving money, but the process that, you know, you've put in place actually is a research leveraging function. Um, and that's why being proactive uh, as a foundation, I think makes much more of a, of a, of a real impact than just looking at uh, competing proposals and giving grants out, but rather it's actually helping, uh, it becomes agenda setting for a uh, research stream um, in this space. And I think that's that's something that's, if not unique, it's pretty unique, but that's what DARPA does in its space. And I think that's a, uh, just the, that, that process, um, I think is different. I think it's huge. Uh, and then Shane, if you ping me, I, will, I have a, there are a couple of names of people who, um, uh, do know about and are working and have worked and know people working in the internet and climate change space. The good news is also they would not be people applying for grants, um, but there are people who know people who are doing the work. So uh, ping me um, offline later this week and I'm happy to make those connections for you. Awesome. Thank you so much. And I'm, I really appreciate um, your words around the process and the, the you know, application process that we're taking on. Uh, it really, that was the hope and that was the goal that we could communicate that and that was the, you know, hoping to speak to the objectives of the program. And so I really, I'm, I'm glad that it, it came across and that you feel that way. So thank you. And I absolutely will, I'll send you a note this week. Thanks. Awesome. Excellent. Thank you. I, I think there's a, a bunch of, you know, additional slides still, right? So. Yes. I'll throw it back to Sarah. Okay, and and certainly don't feel like this has to be the end. If there are questions about research, um, I'll make sure that you all, well, you should have Shana's email, but if you don't, feel free to connect with her directly or through me, 
Um, and yeah, yeah, that's that's great to make the connection so that we can actually reach out. Yeah, excellent, <laughs> excellent. Thank you. Okay, Kevin, let's go back to the slides. <laughs> okay, so we've just been talking about a person, and I'm a person, but we have other people on our team. And here at the next slide, we'll show you some photographs of the team. It's been 12 months since I took this job. And as you'll recall, there was just one picture on the website. <laughs> that would be the one on the far left. And Ilda from um, Internet Society, who was working on Beyond the Net, who anyone in the chapter world would know, moved over to become part of the Staff Foundation, which was Greater Foundation Staff. And we've added quite a few since then, really amazing people. We have our communications manager, Mabel. She's based in Zimbabwe. She is a superstar. She works very closely with the ISOC team to make sure that we're coordinating, integrating messages, learning best practices from one another. She's really great about keeping in touch with them. Connie, I think most of you know from our last meeting, she made her presentation on the tech side of things, on the grants management system. She was also with the Internet Society, has been with the foundation since November. Brittany, you have not met yet. I plan to have her join a board meeting at some time so you can hear her energy, feel her energy that is very similar to Shana. They are a really great dynamic duo when it comes to two program officers. Britt's job, Brittany's job is to help Ilda with the chapter grants and then she also runs the skills program. We've hired a coordinator to support all of us. Rather than just having an EA for an executive director, I thought it was much more important to have someone who everyone could go to and this woman is a miracle and that she takes everything on. This is our New Zealander. This is, she's based in the States. Her name is Julia and she's amazing. Well, you've met Shana and there she is. And then we have um, Ilda who you've seen. So the last one um, position that the board approved the funding for, for my operational budget for 2020 was the monitoring and evaluation manager. So this manager is now being interviewed. We have a couple of amazing candidates. I think we'll probably be making the decision in no more than two weeks. This is really important when it comes to things like impact, because that's what we're about. We want to measure impact and you need somebody who understands the M and E, the monitoring and evaluation area. So that's our next hire. Our other people, next slide please. We've talked about already the selection committee that helps us with deciding which beyond the net large grants to fund and then our independent review panel. This independent review panel is a very fluid group so we right now have about 30 different people, different types of backgrounds. There may be times when we need to bring different types in, depending on what type. Do we have enough researchers? Do we have enough people who understand work in Bangladesh? These kinds of things are always being looked at so that we're sure that whoever is reviewing and scoring our grants is somebody who has a comfort level with that application. So I'm not going to read those long bullet lists of things that these groups do, but you can see what they do and you can see that almost every, well, all of them actually were involved in helping with COVID, not just the emergency response, but also moving forward the skills and the beyond the net large grants, many of which, as you've seen, have to do with COVID. And I feel as the executive director of the Internet Society Foundation, as this pandemic continues to just crush us <laughs> in so many ways. I feel blessed that I'm able to help and my team is able to help address this with the internet for all. Next slide, please. The training I mentioned up front that we are enhancing, I want to share with you first the fact that people are looking at what's on the website. Next slide, please. We have had 1700 unique users of the training. They're spending roughly three minutes on each of the modules. They are, as I mentioned, a heavy read. So we do need to take that from a heavy read to something that's a little more interactive. And the top six countries of users you can see there. So that I did show you during orientation on the website that we do have this page. And next slide, please. We'll be taking it up to the next level. We're gonna start online instructor training, self-paced training, in-person training, well, whenever that's feasible, 
hopefully not too far away, things like chapter workshops. There are all these chapter workshops being scheduled this fall. And wow, wouldn't it be great if we could go in and have some in-person training. Not going to happen this fall, hopefully in the not too distant future. Additionally, we've really felt strongly about skill sharing webinars where they don't just learn from us or from our M&E manager or from someone else at the foundation, but that they learn from each other, that the chapters learn from each other, that our grantees learn from each other. So sharing knowledge on a webinar, we feel is an important part of the training. And then of course, we'll emphasize best practices and case studies. So this way people can continue to learn from one another. So I've talked about all the ongoing program areas. Shana has talked about the new program area. We've talked about our team. We've talked about our technology and our system. We certainly, I hope, have underscored our dedication. I have one more area I'd like to address, and then we'll talk about next steps. Communications, I believe it was Waleed who raised this and the importance of doing this, and we are very committed. We are, as I mentioned, very fortunate to have Mabel in that job, and she's just great. And the fact that she's living in Zimbabwe and knows the African continent and is working very easily with the different time zones has really been a blessing. Um, and she's the kind of person who's both tactical and strategic. It was a rare find for us to hire her. So let me show you some of the things that we've been doing with communications. Next slide, please. Twitter and LinkedIn were originally put up right as I was starting, and we've joined them with Facebook and Instagram. You'll see on the right-hand side, our Twitter followers are growing. It's not like up in the millions yet, but we're gonna get there. <laughs> so it's just been a steady decrease or increase, <laughs> a steady increase, which makes us very happy. And that really is our primary platform. We spend a lot of time putting things out on Twitter. So for all the board members, follow us, follow us, follow us, retweet us, retweet us, retweet us, please. And the same with anything that we post on LinkedIn, Facebook, or Instagram. Our site traffic, what is the Twitter ID to follow? Um, at ISOC underscore FDN, I think, Mike. Let me confirm I'm right about that. Yeah, it's, some, it's like ISOC underscore foundation, and I think it's FDN, but I will check that. Oh, wait, it looks like Waleed got it. <laughs> Thanks, Waleed. Okay, um, so we um, are seeing significant growth in our traffic, certainly when we announce the grant programs launching. And then one thing I want to point out down here um, is that we do have every single thing translated into Spanish and French, including the training program. And while it's not a huge number yet, it's nice to see that nearly 5% of our traffic is being um, uh, tra you know, translated into the French and Spanish versions. And we're assuming certainly as we continue to grow our programs that that will grow. Next slide, please. So these are just some pictures to look at of some of the Twitter and LinkedIn things that we've posted. We're very bold in our messaging and very graphic and colorful. And I love it. I think it looks great. <laughs> um, so these are just some things to look at. And you'll see those when you go to that link, which very thankfully Wally put in there. And he's welcoming or thanking someone in here, Rebecca, I think. Um, <laughs> anyway, next slide, please. In addition to Twitter, to Facebook, to LinkedIn, to Instagram, in addition to populating our website regularly, we very recently decided that we wanted to start, we're calling a newsletter, but it's really a news blast because it's not a newsletter where you have to scroll and scroll and read and look at all these different things. These are two examples of just how powerfully brief and visual they are. But what's most important about this is the engagement for nonprofit benchmarks is a 20% open rate with a 2.66% click rate. And you can check that on Campaign Monitor. If you look at what we did in skills, the open rate was 72.5%. 
the click rate was 17. The open rate on the one on COVID, 76%, click rate of 58. The people who are receiving these news blasts are people who signed up for them. Obviously, that's really important that they asked for them. Yeah, I know, amazing numbers. And these people are signing up through Flux. They always have that option. And then of course, now on the website, you have the option of signing up for the news blasts. So if any of you wanna be added to the list, you can do that via the website. But I'm thrilled with these numbers. I've never seen anything like these before. So yay, I'm happy. So that's the highlight. Um, those are the highlights of our communications work about which we are all very excited. And I just wanna end on the next steps and then take any other questions. So what are we gonna do next? Next slide, please. Well, we're gonna maintain the progress we've been making. We have to, that's what we're all about. We're dedicated, as I said up front. We are passionate, as I said up front. And we wanna track the impact that we're making. So over on the right-hand side, you'll see these are the steps, obviously, that we need to follow making sure the beyond the net small and large grants get out, that they're monitored, that they're being managed well, that they're producing impact. Chainless research program will launch. Communications will continue. Our training program will be enhanced. Continue to support IGF. And then most importantly, I'd like to end by talking about the 2021 action plan. One of the things that this year has done is taught us a tremendous amount. We started, I started, with a wonderful binder from Bridgespan, which I remind Sandy all the time that she gleefully handed me the day that I started, because <laughs> it's about a four inch binder of printed materials. And you know, none of us are used to getting printed materials in a binder anymore. And we took these concepts that people had come up with and we turned them into reality. But we've also learned, you know, we've made errors. Of course we have. There have been things that have been very difficult that we feel like we need to change. So as we move forward in thinking about 2021, we will be recommending some adjustments to the way in which we do things. And I probably, um, I have to talk with Andrew about this and Gonzalo a bit, but I, I probably would like to, to meet with the board before, I definitely, would like to meet with the board before the action plan is delivered and to have some discussion about the lessons learned so that it's not like two weeks before the November board meeting, you get this action plan that might make some recommendations that are totally unfamiliar. So that's something that we're playing with now. We've just finished a retreat where the staff was able to really look at what we call test, learn and adapt where we've tested things, we've learned from them, and in some cases we need to adapt them. But in conclusion, I would like to say we are extremely proud of the work we've done. We feel very emotionally connected to the success of this Internet Society Foundation. We feel it couldn't be more important than it is now. And to be part of it and to have the opportunity to share with you the successes that we've had today means a great deal to, to all of us. So thank you very much for listening and I'll take whatever questions you have. Thank you. Um, thank you, Sarah. Thanks, thanks for everything and, and all the progress and all the work as usual. Um, um, any questions for Sarah? Mike. Yeah, uh, so Sarah, first of all, I know from just hearing from a bunch of other people on this meeting right now, that they share my view that you have done uh, and your team has done remarkable work. Um, I uh, have a lot of experience dealing with people who have to bring programs up and running in short timelines. Uh, and uh, you have exceeded, I think, literally everybody's expectations about what was possible. Um, you know, not, and so uh, that, it's just amazing work. And, and so uh, I, I hope that we are able ultimately to uh, figure out how to extract all your skills and share them with everyone because I think, I think you've done just an amazing job and I wanna see that propagate into the larger world. The, the, speaking of which, uh, just to come back, the, the initial reason I raised my hand was on the uh, skill sharing uh, uh, component where, where you're really talking about sort of peer-to-peer -peer sharing 
of experience among grantees. I know you were looking at uh, a webinar uh, kind of approach to that, but I'm wondering if, and, and you may have answered this with reference to things like uh, Twitter feeds and LinkedIn, you know, stuff, but I'm wondering what other channels are available for uh, grantees to share information uh, with one another, because uh, when I was at Internews, we found that really, really useful to, uh, to let people uh, who've, who've, you know, been down the road in one program in one country uh, share information uh, for other programs in other countries. That's been very helpful. Uh, so I wanted to know what other channels besides the webinar uh, approach you were thinking of. And besides face-to-face -face meetings, which we all are dying to do and probably won't get to do this year, so. Okay, so what's my first choice, Mike? It's face-to-face uh, -face meetings <laughs> where right. we can actually meet each other. Um, I, I, it's really something we're going to have to be creative about. Um, a, a lot of it's going to depend, depend on the willingness and interest of the grantees. I do think a webinar is one way, but I also like the idea of Twitter chats, uh, Facebook lives. I mean, there, there are a lot of different things that we can do on social that I think can help um, to really connect people on maybe more of a regular basis. I mean, one of the things I don't want to do is say, okay, on the 15th of this month, we'll Skillshare. I mean, maybe right. there's, we can, you know, on an ongoing basis, be learning from one another. Well, what, what, what we did uh, when, I, when I had a sort of a similar problem at Internews with uh, maybe uh, 15, 16 different grantees for one program, was I originally thought, you know, maybe we would share a lot of stuff on a wiki, so we set up a wiki, then other people found it was better to work in you know, private groups on Facebook or, you know, whatever was easier, you know, and obviously the main thing is to, is to uh, have the least friction possible yeah. so that it's just easy for people to collaborate. And my advice, my general advice is open every possible channel and see what, you know, see what works for people. Yes, uh, absolutely. I think, I think Facebook turned out to be so intuitive that it worked for a whole population of people that we were working with. So. Yeah, I see while it's talking about Slack, I think your point is really well taken. I, I want to be creative in this, and I want to provide opportunities of different shapes and sizes. You know, it's okay to try six different channels and have one work. I think that's fine. Yeah, of course. Yes, thank you very much. I'd love to hear from some of the new um, trustee members. Just, um, you know, this is a lot of information to take in. I, I totally recognize that. And I know you've had a long day. <laughs> um, and so, uh, and I, get, I think we're getting close to our 90 minutes since we started at 10 past. So I'm keeping an eye on the time. But um, just any comments from any of the new trustee members on, you know, joining and hearing about this. I, I know you've got the orientation from me and we've talked a few times and I've met, met some of you and discussed it, but um, any thoughts would be really welcome. So th thanks for putting them on the spot. Um, <laughs> guys, <laughs> the ball is, is, is with you now. George. George. Hey, you are muted, George. Thank you. Uh, I'm still digesting. I've been involved in some of this grant work. I, I used your uh, earlier system last year as one of the external reviewers. And I must say that uh, the, your focus on changing the technology to be more responsive, uh, uh, I think is absolutely, it was absolutely the right thing to do. Um, and uh, I'm, I'm waiting to see how this all, all um, uh, extends itself into the future. Um, at some point, you're going to have a lot of programs and you're not one to want to continue to add more more areas of, of granting and you'll probably have some consolidation and so on and you'll learn by experience and that's just fine uh, because what you're doing is I think to some extent what Mike said open a lot of channels and see what gets uh, uh, what gets attractive uh, to people and what they apply for and then concentrate on where you get the, the biggest return on investment so um, I want to see what you're planning for 2021. Great. Thank you. Thank you, George. Any more comments or answers to Sarah? Beyond radio silence? 
crickets. Okay. Pepper. Okay. Yeah. I, I, Pepper. I just really quickly responding to, to, to George, one of the things that we talked about early on as we were setting up the foundation and then on the um, uh, uh, advisory group, um, uh, making sure that, you know, it, 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 a lot of, of, of research programs or foundation programs or grant programs seem to have no end. There's never, you never declare victory and go home. Um, and, and we actually had an explicit conversation about that. So it's exactly to your point, George, that you know, it's it. We're looking for, or we, and I think Sarah actually has really executed on it, at least in terms of the framework. We'll see how it all plays out because we're still at the beginning. But the idea is that it always wants to be fresh and be refreshed, and that, um, you know, yeah, we we should actually, you know, um, anticipate success, and right then you can move on to something else and not get stuck in the old. <laughs> your point, I think, is really essential. Um, as one of the things that we were thinking about as we were structuring this from the beginning. Thanks. Thank you. <laughs> and um, I also just always would like to ask Andrew if there's anything he would like to add. He has been my counselor and um, has helped me a great deal and sometimes is a great sounding board. So I just always feel like when we have our meetings that I'd like to ask him if there's anything he would like to add. Uh, somebody asked me on uh, on the sides channel in Slack whether I, uh, you know, am am doing any um, uh, sort of meaningful oversight of uh, of your work, uh, and what I said was that we have uh, weekly meetings during which I mostly sit around and feel useless. So um, uh, I think you're I think you're doing great work, and I I'm super I'm super appreciative. Thank you so much for um everything that's happened. I I this is, you've made more progress than I could have dreamed possible. And it, it really is wonderful to see. I, you know, I, I think um, not everybody uh, will recognize that when, when Sarah presented the plan for uh, Flux being the first priority, there was a certain amount of pushback. People were like, no, no, we got to get the money out the door. This is crazy to be waiting. And uh, I thought, you know, Sarah did a very good job pushing back against, uh, against a board that you know, it was brand new job. She'd just been on the, I mean, what are three weeks or something like that. And, um, uh, and, but negotiated that and people supported it. And I think what we see is that it has really paid off, right? That this was an organized way of doing things. We really got the results that we wanted. We were in a big hurry around, uh, for instance, member Nova, but we didn't take the time to really do a solid job on that. And all we've had are nightmare complaints from the community and exactly the opposite experience happened here. So uh, I think that that, you know, that just shows right from the get go that what we've got is somebody who really, you know, has, has everything under control. And so thank you for, um, you know, making my job easy. Well, thank you because you're not useless on our Monday calls. So, <laughs> all right. Well, um, I know that we have been together a lot these past couple of days. I know it's a weekend and um, so, Gonzalo, I think if there are no other questions, I will say that the um, foundation presentation is concluded mm -hmm. and we thank everyone for their time. Excellent, thank you, Sarah, thanks. But, but don't, don't leave because we, we still have some <laughs> agenda points to discuss. I know. So, <laughs> I know, I know you know that. Um, no, it was, just, it was just confusing, yes, so that some of you are following the minutes just to, to see what's coming up and others are following the latest version of the agenda. And unfortunately, they are not completely in sync. So we're gonna be appointing the advisory committee now, then we will go into executive session, and then we will basically resume into open to observer session to pass the other resolution if appropriate. So um, just bear with me for a second. Sorry? Okay, I, I thought someone was saying something while I was switching the screen. So, so the next point we're going to be discussing is to appoint the Strategic Advisory Committee and um, um, the proposal, let me check. Uh, okay, so the proposal is to have Walid chair the committee and then have Ted, um, Pepper, Olga, Mike, Maimuna and Heather as members. Any, any comments on that? Would you just repeat that? It's a lot of names, Gonzalo. Yeah, sure. Um, Walid is the chair and the members are Ted, Pepper, 
Olga, Mike, Maimuna, and Heather. Um, okay, if there's no comments, I need someone to move. Okay, Pepper moves, Olga seconds. Um, raise your hands for yes votes. Abstentions, no votes. So the resolution passes unanimously. So, so Sarah, you have your new advisory um, committee and Walid is, is the new chair, as, as I announced before. Um, and thanks all of you for volunteering. Um, just for the record, as I mentioned, I usually don't like actually to, to have committees that they are, um, they have more than six members, more than six trustees as members, but this, this time we, we made an exception with this one. And, and also with the finance committee, actually, on the, on the ISOC side of things. But I, I think it's okay, given the, the turnover we are having. Um, that's no big deal. Okay, great. So now we're going to move into executive session. And we will be coming back in, in a few minutes, actually, like in, in 15 minutes or so. Um, if someone wants to you know, stick around or if Hans-Peter wants to stick around. So, Kevin, could you please um, stop the recording and lock the room? We're, we're recording now. Okay, thank you. We just had our executive session. We are back into any other business. So any other business from anyone? Okay, seeing none. So I think we can actually close the meeting. So thanks a lot. Move, would you like to move to adjourn? <laughs> okay, so Mike, Mike moves to adjourn. I second <laughs> that. So the meeting is closed. <laughs> You, you can stop the recording, Kevin. And again, thank you.